Welcome to Battleground Politics. I'm Lauren Make. I'm talking today to Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner. He has been controversial, he has been impeached, and he has been elected twice in Philadelphia. Now he is fighting a new law that provides for a special prosecutor on SEPTA properties. The new law, also known as Act 40, was sponsored by a Republican state senator. It was passed by lawmakers in Harrisburg, and it was signed into law by Democratic Governor Josh Shapiro. I spoke to the governor about the new law on a recent episode of NBC 10 at Issue. He says that it allows the state to put more law enforcement resources into addressing crime in Philadelphia. <clears throat> there are people who feel like he's the elected DA. He was elected to do this job, putting somebody else in there and giving them a responsibility that would be otherwise be his responsibility is taking power away from someone the voters voted for. You to don't see clear, it that way? I don't. It's concurrent jurisdiction, something that already exists in our laws. And it was voted on and passed by state representatives and senators from Philadelphia and the surrounds where SEPTA is to provide uh, that level of authority. And the attorney general is elected by the people of Pennsylvania as well. Krasner disagrees with the governor's perspective on that. I talked to Krasner about what the governor had to say about Act 40. We talked about working with the new Parker administration and whether he'll run for a third term. We're joined now in studio by Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner to talk about Act 40 and more. Welcome. Great to be here. So I know that you are fighting this in court right now, but uh, are you preparing for the possibility that this takes full effect and that a special prosecutor is eventually appointed? We are preparing to defend Philadelphia votes, and what that means is you don't pass laws that would erase 155,000 of them just because somebody thinks it's good politics. There are certain things that absolutely should not be negotiable, and one of them is the erasure of votes in the largest and most diverse city in Pennsylvania. This it falls within a pattern of 250 years of disenfranchisement of certain people, and I'm just not going to accept it. Obviously, we heard from Governor Shapiro. Um, he told me that he does not think that this um, takes power away from you. I know you have said you believe he is wrong. Have you talked to him about this? I would be delighted to talk to him about it. There have, have you talked to him about it? I have it? not spoken to Why him not? about it. Well, he hasn't talked to me in years, frankly. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to him. He has my cell phone. He can call me anytime. You can call the governor's office, too, if you would like to discuss this. I mean, we can do it now if you would like. My, well, cell, phone, my cell phone's right here. I don't have him here today. Uh, you're welcome to give him a call if you'd like. Uh, but why did you not make an attempt to talk to him about it? Why did I not make an attempt? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I wouldn't put it that way. What has actually happened is an enormous number of clergy in Philadelphia reached out to try to talk to him because they supported him when he ran for governor and to tell him not to sign it. He did not return their calls. He did not speak to them. As far as I know, he still has not met with them. There's a lot of people from Philadelphia that Governor Shapiro is unwilling to talk to about this issue. And there's a very good reason, which is this is the erasure of black and brown and young and broke votes from Philadelphia and only from Philadelphia. This is discrimination. This is unacceptable. This is not what real Democrats do. And it's not what we have to do for democracy. There were some Democrats who voted for this. There are always some people who are, who are profiles in courage, and there are always some people who are a weather vane, and they're going to go where the wind blows. Um, I really hope for the best for my Democratic colleagues, but something should never be on the table. It's never on the table to erase 155,000 Philadelphia votes, and that's the number of votes that put me in office the last time. We won with 70, what was it, 2% of the vote. We had a 44% margin. And we're going to do what now? We're going to appoint someone who's not elected to take over our powers. I mean, this is, frankly, a part of a war on democracy. And it should be that the Democrats stand up to it. It should not be that any of them are willing to support it. Uh, you mentioned some of the folks who have, have, are supporting you and have fi uh, filed with the court uh, to do so. Um, from a legal standpoint, what difference do you, do you think that will make? Do you think that that will make an impact on this case? Well, I certainly hope so. You know, we are at a moment when there is a sweeping authoritarian wave in this country. It is trying to deny the results of elections when the elections don't go their way. It is trying to make sure that voters are disqualified 
all across the country, and unfortunately it has taken the form in Pennsylvania of uniquely trying to discriminate against Philadelphia voters and erase their votes. I'll say it again, that should never, ever, ever, ever be on the table. There is no Democrat who should ever support this kind of measure. Um, I will say this, I'm a great believer in second chances, and in the case of some people, third and fourth chances, but it's time for Democrats to act like Democrats. It's time for Democrats not to be led by Republicans who have already declared war and democracy in the United States. There is an election coming up. There's a primary election coming up. Well, how do you, vote, do you think voters should handle that? Well, we I, did vote for I, I will do everything in my power, you know, partly as an aspect of my job, to protect this election, to make sure we do not have people uh, who are intimidated or pushed away. There's no cheating in this election. I'm going to do that. But more to the point, Act 40 itself discourages voters. There's an awful lot of seniors who pulled out their walkers and went to the polls on Election Day because they had an opinion on who should make the decisions about criminal justice in Philadelphia, and they voted for me. So what are they being told? They're being told, thank you so much for your struggle to vote. Your vote doesn't count. We're going to have an unelected person, unelected person, appointed to take your job because somehow... We cannot trust the voters of Philadelphia. We can trust them in 66 other counties, 66 other counties that are much less urban, much less diverse. We just can't trust them here. We all know what this is. This is disenfranchisement one more time. You can dress it up, but the bottom line is take off the Halloween costume. This is nothing but the erasure of votes, the discouragement of votes at a time when Philadelphia itself could potentially determine who is the next president of the United States. This is terrible law. This is unconstitutional, and it's the worst kind of politics for the Democratic Party. You're going through um, a, a legal process right now, but do you think that there's a possibility um, for any uh, federal um, legal action on this? We are ruling out nothing. I think it's pretty Are you considering it? Uh, we are considering all options. I think it's pretty clear that this denies equal protection to voters in Philadelphia. There is an equal protection clause in the United States Constitution, so that could be federal court. There's an equal protection aspect to the Pennsylvania Constitution, so that could be state court. But this is just utterly unacceptable. They should never, ever, ever be negotiating for the erasure of votes in Philadelphia. Uh, SEPTA has also filed to, to intervene here, saying uh, that this would give uh, SEPTA and um, the city of Philadelphia an additional resource to fight crime. What's your response to the way they are looking at it. Well, let, let me just say this. There's SEPTA and there's SEPTA. I have plenty of friends in SEPTA who think this is totally outrageous, that somehow somebody's Republican buddy lawyer is getting a lot of money to uh, do this for SEPTA. So well, why do you think SEPTA, SEPTA is, is... is not actually speaking with one voice at all? What's going on here is other kinds of politics. So why do you think that they filed that? I think that there is a cottage industry in feeding Republican lawyer friends incredible amounts of money on things like the impeachment... Uh, which is going to fail, and on things like this. I mean, there are literally over $3 million spent on legal fees so far for an impeachment that is going to be rejected by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The same thing is happening here. Can you specifically address their argument, though? What do you say about the argument that they have put on the record in court saying uh, this would give them and the city an additional resource to fight crime? It does not give the city and it does not give them any additional resource. That's just flatly false. What they are doing is snatching away a well-organized prosecutor's office from its duties. If that's what they meant, then they would be doing it in Montgomery County, Delaware County, Chester County, all these other places where SEPTA goes. But they're not doing it there. There are other factors in play here. Some of us are actually trying to do things in the Democratic Party that will include more Democratic votes. It will include reluctant votes. It will include young people, black people, brown people, people who feel like the government has not served them well. Well, there is, unfortunately, a small group of Democrats and a huge group of Republicans who don't want to hear from those people. And I do want to hear from those people. That is what we're getting at. Now, if you look at the big, big picture, the big, big picture is that the sponsor of this bill, who is, I believe, Senator Langerholk from around Johnstown, this is a guy from an area that's 71 percent Trump. This is a guy who has four, four state correctional institutions within his zone. Those state correctional institutions run on prisoners, and they're used to getting those prisoners from Philadelphia. We have kept our promise to make sure that the ones they get need to be in jail and to make sure that when people are there for lousy reasons, we keep them out. 
Well, they're losing money. These are counties that don't have coal anymore. They don't have steel anymore. So what they have is prisons. And they're going to pull in about $60,000 per year per inmate. Philadelphia used to supply almost 30% of the prisoners in the state and now supplies 23%. I am so sorry that, I, we, are, I that we are what ending saying, mass he incarceration. Get, he did not make this law on, him, uh, on his own. He certainly had other lawmakers voting for it, Republicans and Democrats, and a Democratic governor who, as we've said, signed it. Um, let's talk about what this would look like mm -hmm. if it happened. As we are sitting here today, the past few days, we have had uh, shootings on or around SEPTA. Right. If a special prosecutor were in place, what would happen with those cases right now? I mean, to be honest, heaven knows they are not set up to handle these cases. This is not an established structure. The law itself is so vague, you can't even tell what areas it covers, whether it covers a small distance from SEPTA routes or not, whether it covers all the way up to 500 yards in every direction. There is one tortured interpretation of this law that says it would cover 91% of the entire landmass of Philadelphia and 81% of all the crimes that occur in Philadelphia. I've seen you reference that 500 yards before. Can you explain where that's coming from? It's coming from case law having to do with uh, police forces that are applicable to smaller units. For example, campuses, things of that sort. Um, do I agree with that interpretation? No. But is it possible? Yes, because this law is so vague, so poorly written. It's a law that, in addition to erasing all these votes, would enable taking money from Philadelphia taxpayers while nullifying their votes. The whole notion is not only are we going to take away all this power, but we're going to make Philadelphia pay for it. So what do you get then? You get we steal your taxes, we erase your votes. That's what's actually happening. So you say you don't, you don't know. You don't know. Heaven knows you said what, um, you know, what would happen in those cases, what would you be doing? What would your office be doing? Would you, would you go in there and try and say, hey, no, we want these cases? Would you sit back and say, go ahead? What, how do you handle it? Well, the, the law itself, uh, vague though it is, is actually a cherry-picking law. It basically says that this unelected, appointed special prosecutor who doesn't really even have office space and gets to just sort of no, leech, leech that, off the I'm attorney asking, general's how office. How would you handle it? I, I'm, I'm trying to explain. They cherry pick, which means that we have to go ahead and prosecute every case. And then they get to look around and go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I like that one. That one seems like a winner. That is good politics. And then they take it. That's what the law says. They can take none of them. They can take all of them within this vague zone that might be almost the entire city or might be much closer than that. So what you have to do then is you have to go ahead as normal and investigate and get ready to prosecute every case. You would. Yes, you have to do that. And then they get to show up whenever they feel like it and say, ours now. Now, this can work two, two ways. One of the ways it works is if you have, let's say, a shooting on SEPTA, they could show up and grab that. But another way it works is if you have a SEPTA police officer who commits crimes... They could show up, take that, and drop it. And it would leave us with no recourse as Philadelphians to actually enforce the law in an even-handed way. Uh, simply put, this is the worst kind of transactional, anti-democratic law. And I intend to die on this hill fighting against any effort to erase the votes of people who should have the opportunity to elect their own district attorney. I, I understand your argument. And, and you were elected twice in, in this city by voters. Um, if we do set that aside for a moment, though, and take a look at the issue of, okay, how do we address crime on and around SEPTA? We have just had, as we said, several days um, where we had shootings on and around SEPTA. Um, and it, it is violence that is unacceptable. Um, what do you think would make a difference? If, if this won't, what do you think would make a difference? Forensics. I, I have, I'm five years in now saying, please, give us a state-of-the-art forensics lab. SEPTA has already done some things extremely well. They have, an extra cam they have an excellent camera system, both on the outside of the vehicles and also with all in all the stations. Those are used routinely not only for things that happen on SEPTA, but they're used for things that happen on the street where a bus has to be, happens to be going by. But what is needed on top of that is a really high level of forensics because that's how you solve the cases that cannot be solved. That's how you take a strong case and make it an unbeatable case. So that is one thing that we have to do. Another thing that we have to do is figure out why are SEPTA's arrests so low. SEPTA's arrests have dropped almost 50% in the last six or seven years. 
while my office has continued to charge these cases at a very high rate. We charge 93 percent of the cases that we are given. That's the same high level as existed under prior administrations. There is no lack of capacity here. We do an excellent job with these cases. We're just seeing a lot fewer of these cases. Why that is, I don't know, but we stand ready to work with SEPTA to try to help them so they're able to solve more cases and make more arrests. SEPTA is now saying they're going to go basically after every code, every violation in the code book that they can find, drug use, uh, uh, fair, um, fair jumping, uh, and illegal possession of guns, uh, that they are just going to go after everything that they can find. How do you feel about that approach? You know, they're entitled to make the decision they want to make. My office's job almost always, except, for example, with homicide cases, but it almost always begins at the point where a law enforcement agency, such as SEPTA police, present us with a package of material and say, please charge this. And then they make recommendations on the charges, and then we, 93% of the time, we have been essentially following those recommendations and bringing those charges. Their decision not to charge or not to seek charges on some of these in the past is something they're reconsidering. I'm fine with that. The bottom line is that we are going to do justice with the cases that come to us. Um, I would be happy to see more cases come to us. You're somebody who um, uses a lot of data. I know it's really important to your office. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of smiled at that. I know it's, it's something that you bring up a lot. Um, when it comes to um, preventing crime, when it comes to um, discouraging criminal acts, though, do you, do you think that there is an intangible to that that people think you might just not have? I, I am well aware of the criminology around this. We actually have a Ph.D. criminologist in the office. It's the first time our office ever had that. The criminology is real clear. If you think you're going to get caught, you won't do it. That's do you how, think, do you that's think how people it works. in Philly think they're going to get caught? I think that the numbers speak for themselves. You know, if you look, for example, at retail theft, 8%. 8% are arrested. 92% are not arrested. I think that has an impact. And obviously we want to work and we're working vigorously with the city on that issue. But we need to catch more of those people. And we need to do so in collaboration with stores and with the police and with the reality that they have issues with the level of staffing. Um, I think that when you are looking at shootings, there were times during the pandemic when only 20% of the shootings were being solved. Well, that means 80% of the shooters were getting away with it. That's getting better now, but we have a long way to go in large part because we don't have the forensics that we need, and we're not using modern investigative techniques. So I think, yes, it's incredibly important that we are able to work together, and I'm more than happy to help shoulder this burden to solve more of these cases because that does deter crime. There's obviously a new um, police commissioner um, mm -hmm. and a new uh, mayoral administration. Um, how is that going so far? How, what's your relationship at this point? Well, uh, my relationship with Commissioner Bethel is excellent. I actually was just speaking to him yesterday evening about a few things. Uh, we have regular meetings, and it's very positive. I've had one opportunity to meet with the mayor. I'm hoping to have more. Um, looking forward to working with her, and I remain optimistic that there may be some really good things coming during this administration. But I think it is incredibly important. If we're going to talk about One Philly, we're going to talk about intergovernmental collaboration, then I think it's really important that my ability to communicate with other elected officials is more than once now and then, it, that it is more frequent. I think uh, it would be a good thing at many levels. And we, you know, my door is wide open, my phone is on, everybody's got my cell phone. So I look forward to having more opportunities to work together. One thing I think of that I, I know is on the Parker administration's radar is Kensington dealing with uh, crime there, mm -hmm. drug use, drug sales, um, and then that is something that they are working to, to make a plan on. Will you be part of that plan? I hope so. I can tell have you. Have you been contacted at all to be part of it? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. So I have been meeting with uh, what has been referred to as the Kensington Caucus mm -hmm. uh, for quite a few months and in advance of Mayor Parker coming into office. We are in those meetings. In fact, we have another one in two days. Um, they are behind closed doors. They're highly collaborative. Police are there. We have elected officials who are there. And we're going to continue to do that. Uh, the meetings that are going on with the police commissioner, with other elected officials, I'm not in all of them, nor do I expect to be in all of them. But it is certainly my hope that people who have subject matter expertise, who know something about prosecution, who know something about police investigation, 
are all in the room when some of these decisions are made because that is how we make the best decisions. If they do start making more arrests there, more drug arrests, um, what, do you, what do you think your role should be and, and how, how do you think that should play out? Our role has been that we have charged every drug case essentially, that has been brought to us. We have charged even drug possession cases since the beginning of 2018 with two exceptions. One is marijuana possession. We don't charge that because that's stupid, frankly. That's like charging people for having a beer at the end of prohibition. And we also don't charge buprenorphine because buprenorphine is an anti-opioid cure drug. In other words, it's a drug that you take in treatment. So people who are on the street are addicted to opioids and have no access to medical care sometimes obtain them illegally. I see no value in trying to stop people from seeking their own treatment when they're suffering from opioid addiction on the street. But every other drug and marijuana sales, we have always charged these cases. There have been many times when we couldn't get it to the finish line because the city didn't have the forensics to give us a drug analysis, okay? That's the reality of what's going on here. We need to have the forensics that will support modern prosecution and modern investigation in Philadelphia in order to be more effective. You obviously are um, dealing with what is going to happen with Act 40. Um, you've seen an impeachment. Um, are you going to run for re-election? We'll know soon. Um, I can tell you that there is no limit on the number of terms I can serve. I think Lynn Abraham was a district attorney after being appointed uh, for a total of 19 years before Seth Wills Williams defeated her and then unfortunately went to jail before he finished his second term. Um, so I do have the ability to do that. I'll be making that decision close to the end of the year. But I can tell you I love my job. I think that we've made a very, very important big difference. I am delighted to see that last year was nationally and locally, uh, by all indications, the biggest drop in violent crime in recorded history. And I hope nobody dismisses that because it means a lot. When you look at the data today, and I did look today like I look every day, the data that is publicly available from the PPD, you will see that in every category of violent crime but one, crime is down. That one category is aggravated assault without a gun. And that's up about 1%. So, you know, we're seeing some very positive things. I think that the robust investment in prevention has made a difference. I think that the advocacy all these years for forensics has resulted in a pot of money. The pot's not big enough. We need 75 to 150 million. We have 30 million. But that pot could be filled in a second if our governor wanted to actually give us the forensics that our police need to solve these crimes. That's the kind of thing that could be done and done quickly. That would make a huge difference. Have you made a decision and you don't want to say it or you haven't actually made the decision yet? I have not actually said it. You have not actually said what your decision is, but you've made one. Uh, well, I've made one, but, you know, life is unpredictable. Things can happen. Um, I will tell you this, though. I love my job. Does that mean you want to stay? We'll be, why we'll, wouldn't you stay? We'll, then? We'll have, then, then why wouldn't you stay? Things happen, you know. People, people, does, does the, people will have, the, outcome, people will the have, outcome of the special prosecutor case have anything to do with whether you stay? Um, the special prosecutor case is a force that is pushing me strongly to stay because there are certain things that cannot be tolerated. And one of them is the erasure of black and brown and broke and young votes in a single county that is discriminatory. That kind of authoritarian bullying of Philadelphia voters makes me want to stay. So even if the courts were to say, yes, they can do this, and a special prosecutor comes in, that would still make you want to stay? Yes. So I'm going to go back to the first question that I asked you. Are you preparing for that possibility, and what would you do in that case? We prepare to continue to do what we always do, which is charge all the cases where there is probable cause. That is what we have been doing steadily. That is what the law presumes that we would do. It doesn't say, you get to stand down, we do this. What it says is, you do all this stuff, and then we'll cherry pick it. So from our perspective, what is there to prepare for? We will just continue doing the excellent work that we already do. And if they want to come around later and cherry pick, then we'll just deal with that. We, look, we are going to follow the law, even if an improper decision, an unconstitutional decision, 
is made, we are going to follow the law. But that law is going to come from the courts. It's not going to come from, some, from some legislator who wants a bunch of Philadelphia bodies, more specifically black and brown bodies, to put in his jail to make money. And that is where this really comes from. D.A. Krasner, thank you for your time. It's wonderful to see you. Good to talk to you. Thank you. So there were a couple of things in that conversation with the district attorney that we want to follow up on. After that interview, I reached out to the governor's office about what D.A. Krasner said about clergy from Philadelphia trying to talk to the governor about the special prosecutor legislation. The governor's office tells me they have been in touch with members of clergy from Philly. They said that the governor, speaker, and House Majority Leader would be meeting with clergy members from the city in the coming days. That interview and my conversation with the governor's office were on Wednesday, March 6th. Also, the district attorney talked about the sponsor of the bill, State Senator Wayne Langerholk. I reached out to the senator after that interview to get his response to what Larry Krasner said about him and prisons in his district. Senator Langerholk told me Krasner is wasting his time playing politics, that the DA's inferences were ridiculous and that the bill is about a safety issue. You can find more Battleground Politics on NBC10.com slash Battleground Politics. And you can subscribe for upcoming episodes wherever you get your podcasts.